Well, I saved the hottest for last as it relates to these doctrines um, that I believe have been so beneficial for us as, as the family of God to understand as we've considered the doctrine of angels and, and the doctrines of, of demons and Satan. And we've looked at for two weeks we spent talking about um, about heaven, a theology of heaven. And this week we are going to be talking, as you've heard us say a couple of times, uh, about the biblical doctrine of hell. And the reason why we do this is because we know, uh, like these other topics, it is, uh, it is very poorly understood. Uh, there is a, you know, there's a real movement in our time to assume that hell, you know, that Satan is nothing more than this short, fat, little um, arrow-tailed, pitchfork-wearing, red satin suit with horns, baby, and, uh, and that, that hell is a place that we're going to go to where we have en endless, you know, uh, beer bongs, and it's just like a frat party uh, that is just continuous, and we're going to enjoy ourselves there, and, uh, and I hope to, to, to completely dispel that myth and, uh, and to disabuse you of that notion. Many in our day struggle with the goodness of God as they see the doctrine of hell as a spot or a blemish on his record. And it's understandable in our time that we have questions about such things, but they need to be framed as questions and not as statements about his moral character. The question that is often asked from those who struggle with this doctrine is, what grounds does God have to punish someone for eternity? Has this question been asked of you as you've attempted to speak the gospel to someone as you've talked to your family or friends? And inevitably the question comes around to hell and they say, do you believe in hell? And you say, yes. And they say, well, how in the world could God, if he is good, have justification to create hell and send someone to it? And this, this question certainly needs to be answered. I hope we do that through this study. And I, I hope that, um, that when we come to this topic, not only today, but as we, we look at this topic um, in discussions with our family and friends and coworkers and neighbors, which I'm sure you're going to run out today and go talk to everyone about hell, um, I, I pray that you handle this uh, in a very gentle way because it certainly is a, a horrifying topic. It really is. It is just a horrifying topic. But I think the problem is, is we are asking wrong questions and therefore we're getting wrong answers. I think a more pressing question that we need to be asking and that is often overlooked is this. What justification is there for a holy and perfect God to forgive a wicked and rebellious sinner? What justification is there for a holy and perfect God to forgive a wicked and rebellious sinner? In other words, what grounds does God have to forgive the most vile and wretched of people? This is a cosmic problem. The reason why this is such a problem in our day, and what I think is uh, perhaps the most difficult job as a preacher of the gospel, is to constantly demonstrate to you the bankruptcy of a secular worldview. Now, when I say a secular worldview, I'm not simply speaking of a worldview that denies the existence of God, that is atheistic, or that denies the, the truth and reality, uh, the inerrancy of Scripture. That's not what I'm speaking of. I'm speaking of a worldview that is secular in the sense that it starts with man as the basic given reality of the universe. It starts with man as the center of all things, and it concerns itself with man's rights, man's, de man's desires, and man's plans, his expectations. And it starts from this center, and it moves its way out, and it puts this lens on to view all things, including God. And this secular mindset is so pervasive in our day, in our culture, but it's not just out of the camp of Christians, it's within the Christian camp. We are so inculcated in our culture. This is so pounded in our heads over and over and over again. We are swimming. It is the air that we breathe. It is the way that we do theology today. It is the way that we read scriptures. It is the way that we preach the gospel. It is the books that are written, the seminaries that teach classes. It is all of this. It is the secular mindset that starts with man as the basic given reality and starts with his needs and his desires, his expectations, and his goals
to see that this is on a radical collision course with the biblical worldview. Now, this is not because, and when I say biblical worldview, I'm not speaking of a biblical worldview that just simply acknowledges intellectually the existence of God. And I'm not saying a biblical worldview because it says that the Bible is in 